This short video covers the basic principles of how to perform the erector spiny plane or ESP block. The ESP block can broadly be defined as an injection into the fascial plane deep to the erector spiny muscle that runs the length of the posterior torso, usually in the same parasagittal plane as the tips of the vertebral transverse processes. There are several variations of the ESP block at this time. High thoracic, mid thoracic, low thoracic, and lumbar. The choice of which you perform depends on the clinical indication for the block. The preparation for an ESP block is the same regardless. A linear probe is generally suitable in slim patients in the thoracic region, but in many individuals, the high thoracic and low thoracic transverse processes can be quite deep due to the overlying muscle layers. And I have a low threshold for using a curved probe which often provides much better penetration and contrast in terms of lighting up the fascial layers. And I consider this more important than resolution for this particular block technique. In adults, I almost always use an 80 millimeter block needle. It can be helpful to use a three-way stopcock setup that allows hydrolocation with non-active fluid so that there is no wastage of local anesthetic with injection into the wrong plane. If a continuous block is desired, you may use any nerve block or epidural catheter set or a specialized catheter over needle peripheral nerve block set. These blocks are designed primarily for analgesia, so a long duration local anesthetic is almost always indicated. In adults, the recommended injection volume is 20 to 30 milliliters. Larger volumes may result in epidural spread and the unwanted effects of sympathetic or motor block. The concentration of local anesthetic should be adjusted according to the total volume injected, always observing the maximum recommended milligram dose limits. This is especially relevant if performing bilevel or bilateral blocks. I have come to prefer ropivacaine 0.25 to 0.5% with 5 micrograms per mil of epinephrine, but I will also use bupivacaine 0.25% with epinephrine. Occasionally, I will mix some 2% lidocaine with 0.5% bupivacaine in a 1 to 3 ratio to get a faster onset. Epinephrine is important in reducing the risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. And note that while an analgesic effect often starts to be apparent within 10 to 15 minutes, my own research in volunteers has shown that the time to maximum clinical effect and the extent of spread is closer to 60 to 90 minutes, even when using pure lidocaine. The expected duration of analgesia with single injections of ropivacaine or bupivacaine is 6 to 12 hours. Now, the addition of dexamethasone or dexmedetomidine to the local anesthetic solution may help prolong duration based on the currently available published data. Personally, I often add dexamethasone as I consider the benefit risk ratio to be favorable. Dexmedetomidine is currently too expensive in my practice to use routinely, and thus I have little experience with it. The patient may be positioned prone, lateral, or sitting. This is dictated by the clinical environment and what feels most ergonomic. Ergonomics should also dictate where you stand and whether you choose to insert the needle in a cranial to caudal or caudal to cranial direction. The direction of needle insertion may also influence to a minor extent whether cranial or caudal spread tends to predominate. Identify the target level by counting ribs. For levels from T2 to T6, I usually start by identifying the first rib and counting downwards, a process I've described elsewhere. For low thoracic levels, I may instead identify the 12th rib and count upwards. From this lateral longitudinal view of ribs and pleura, slide the probe slowly towards the midline, looking for the transition from rib to transverse process. This is signaled by a change in the bony contour and decreased visibility of the pleura as it curves downwards. Experiment with small sliding and tilting probe movements to optimize the visibility of the transverse processes and most importantly, the deep fascia of the erector spinae muscle. The final optimal view should be one that gives a clear view of the fascial layer that separates the muscle and the transverse processes. If the beam is directed more medially, the bony contour will change from squared off transverse processes to a flatter profile of the lamina.
Noticing these details will help orientate you when you're manipulating the probe to try and achieve in-plane needle beam alignment. I recommend using a longer needle to infiltrate skin and muscle with local anesthetic and to then use it as a seeker needle to better plan your trajectory and needle beam alignment. Advance the needle aiming to land towards the edge of the transverse process rather than the middle of it. This allows advancement of the tip slightly deeper beyond the fascial layer if necessary. It is critical that the tip be placed deep or anterior to the investing fascia of the erector spinae muscle. Perform test injections of 0.5 to 1 mL of fluid, looking for linear spread that lifts the muscle and its the fascia, rather than causing expansion within the muscle. Any fluid spread should also travel in both cranial and caudal directions. Now, if you're uncertain if the tip is in the correct plane, I recommend advancing a little deeper even to the point of performing what some people might call a hybrid ESP-MTP block. Note that there can still be some intramuscular spread as local anesthetic can track backwards along the needle shaft, but this should not be the only pattern that is seen. It can sometimes be tricky to identify the optimal plane of injection, as these two videos will show. There can be several layers of fascia that form that deep layer below the erector spinae muscle, and it's important that you perform dynamic scanning during the test injections and use the non-active fluid to avoid wastage of local anesthetic. During the dynamic scanning, Look for the deepest bright white fascial layer that's overlying the transverse processes and the darker intertransverse tissues. Where necessary, insert the needle deeper as I've already described to ensure that the needle tip and fluid spread lie below that deepest white fascial layer. The second video on the right further illustrates this process. Here you see the needle tip advancing through the muscle and piercing the fascial layer that runs over the transverse processes and the intertransverse tissues. It's not clear with the initial injection if fluid is spreading below, so the probe is manipulated to try and scan and see a clear demarcation of the fascial layer as well as the fluid spread below it. Here now we see a clear fluid spread with a linear pattern that lifts muscle. Note that having the needle tip land precisely on the tip of the transverse process is probably not critical. These micro CT images show the presence of two slits or gaps in the boundary between the erector spiny plane and the paravertebral intercostal space through which local anesthetic can penetrate. So, being slightly medial towards the laminar or slightly lateral towards the rib intercostal junction is probably acceptable. However, once needle tip position is confirmed and negative aspiration is verified, I recommend injecting the remaining volume fairly quickly under pressure to promote physical spread through those gaps into the paravertebral space. If inserting a catheter and using a catheter through a needle set, I inject the loading bolus through the needle and then take advantage of the space created to thread 4 to 5 centimeters of the catheter beyond the needle tip. Similarly, if using a catheter over a needle set, try to use a shallow trajectory and advance the needle and or the catheter at least 2 to 3 centimeters into the space. Having this length within the space will reduce the risk of subsequent catheter tip dislodgement out of the plane which can occur because of erector spinae muscle contraction and relaxation as the patient moves. There is currently no good evidence for optimal dosing regimens, but anecdotally, program intermittent boluses are preferable, usually in volumes of 10 to 15 mils administered every two to three hours. If this is not feasible, use continuous infusion at higher rates of seven to 10 mils per hour 
and supplement with patient-initiated or manual boluses of local anesthetic as needed. Finally, on completion of the block, the patient should be monitored for at least 30 to 45 minutes for symptoms or signs of delayed local anesthetic systemic toxicity. This is the most likely adverse effect, although it's still uncommon. Local anesthetic concentrations tend to peak within the first 10 to 15 minutes. A last management kit that includes 20% lipid emulsion must be readily available for use if needed. Fortunately, other adverse events with the ESP block are extremely rare.